Uh, today, the structure will be somewhat similar, but the content will be quite different. Uh, so we're going to have two sets of research talks this morning, followed by hands-on exercises. Uh, but as opposed to yesterday, the content, both of the talks and the exercises, are going to be focused on more recent projects and you know, active projects that are kind of researchy at this point. So uh, in the exercises in particular, you'll get to play with some genomics data and you know, use the Atom software that Frank was talking about last night. Uh, you'll also get to work on a new framework for machine learning pipelines, uh, as well as Spark R, which is you know, a new component uh, in the Badass stack. So these are pretty exciting new projects that students have been working hard on, so uh, hopefully you'll enjoy them. Uh, and our first talk today, actually, before I introduce this first speaker, a uh, few announcements. So one, for the exercises today, similar to yesterday, how you after, you know, after you had everything on your USB key, you had to download a zip file. You're going to have to do that again today. The link for those, and it might actually be two zip files. Uh, those zip files are still not online, so I'll make an announcement later. But just remember, you, you can't run any of these exercises without downloading something. You're using the same content that was on your USB key, but you need these one to two additional files. So I'll give you more information about that later. Second, uh, there's one lost and found item. There was a, a big envelope, big flat envelope with some color swabs inside of it. I don't know if that is anyone's, but if it is, you can go to the front desk and, and retrieve it. OK, anyway, with that, our, uh, are you on? I'm on. You need to switch something. Oh, yeah, one, one sec. I need to push a one. Yeah. Um, let's see if that works. All right, cool. All right, so our first speaker today is Dan Crankshaw. He is a second year uh, database PhD student in the AMP Lab. And he will be talking about VLOX, which is a cool model serving framework that, yeah, that's open research right now. So thanks, Dan. Cool, thanks. Um, yeah, so I'm going to tell you today a little bit about a new project in the lab called VELOX. Um, and VELOX is really um, a project to look at the machine learning life cycle, the machine learning model life cycle as a whole. Um, and this is work with a whole bunch of awesome collaborators in the lab. So the last yesterday, and I guess for the rest of today, you're going to hear about a bunch of really cool projects in the AMP lab. Um, and a lot of them have to do with machine learning. But really, they all focus on one component of machine learning. They all pretty much focus on taking data, often massive data sets, and using that to train machine learning models. We've done a lot of work um, in the lab and sort of as a broader research community on training machine learning models. But that's not really all that we want to do when we're talking about machine learning. Models at rest, uh, models just sitting in HDFS that have been trained, aren't actually all that useful. Really what we want to do is use those models to serve predictions and get feedback on those predictions and feedback on those models and use that as more training data and improve our models. And we want to do this over and over again to continually improve our prediction process. So that's really what Velox is focused on, is how to address these challenges in taking a trained model and using it to serve predictions and improve the model quality as we serve these predictions. So let's dig into this a little bit more with an example. Say that I wanted to build Catify, uh, streaming music for cats. How would I do it today? Well, if I want this to be a web service, the first thing I need to do is put together my web stack. So I've got a database, and I've got my little app server, I've got an HTTP server, and now I can play music for my cats. But I don't know what music to play. I can sort of play music randomly for them, or I can make them go through my whole catalog. But there's no really way to, to figure out what music they'd most like out of my 20 million songs before, without the user asking for it. So that's where machine learning comes in. We can make this service predictive, and therefore improve our user experience by, by playing the music that our cats want to listen to without them having to explicitly say that. So the first thing to do when we have a machine learning task is figure out what exactly are we actually trying to predict. So, so for Catify, what we're trying to predict is of all the songs in my catalog, for each cat, how likely is what, uh, basically, how much is that cat going to like each of these songs? We want to predict how much, uh, what this cat would rate all of these songs. And then once we have these predictions, then we can figure out OK, we'll play the songs that they're going to rate the highest. And they don't even have to uh, go through and actually make all these ratings. So, so let's go back to our familiar training machine learning models story. We know how to do this. You heard talks yesterday. You're going to hear some cool talks about the Pipelines project today to train machine learning models. So we're just going to use all that work in Velox. We've got our big training data set. 
We're going to put it into Spark. We're going to use a, an awesome Spark pipeline and train the model. And then we've got this trained model, and we put it in HDFS. OK, so going back to Cat Catify right now, we can play music for our cats. And we've got an awesome model that tells us which music to play that's sitting in HDFS. But, but how do we connect these two? And that's where Velox comes in. So, so what does connecting these two components mean? Well, we want to be able to serve predictions from this model and use that to guide which songs we play. And then we want to see how the cats react to these predictions and use that as additional training data to continue to improve our model. So how do we do this today? Well, one thing we could do, since really what we want is to, is to serve predictions, is just materialize all of our predictions. And this, it works OK. Um, we can materialize all of our predictions, put it in Mongo, and then when we want to um, play a new song, we look up the prediction and figure out whether to play it or not. But there's actually some problems with this. So the output of these trained models uh, that are trained in Spark is basically a bunch of parameters about all of our songs and a bunch of parameters about all of our users. And that doesn't actually take up all that much space. If we want to have personalized models, personalized predictions, we pretty much need, to need all this space. But when we materialize all of our songs, we end up with this n squared blow up, which is both computationally inefficient and spatially inefficient, because we have to compute all of these predictions and store them, even though we probably don't need most of them. OK, so there's some problems with how we serve predictions. But there's, there's some more stuff going on as well. As we're serving predictions, we're getting new training data, because cats are liking these songs, they're giving them thumbs down, they're skipping them. We want to incorporate this additional training data, use it to retrain the model in Spark, and then put this new model back into our serving system, uh, rematerializing all of our predictions. OK. So this kind of works, but there's a whole bunch of problems with doing this today. So what's wrong with this picture? Well, for one, I have to build, every time I do this, I have to build this whole system from scratch. I have to, I have to set up my, uh, I have to set up how to materialize these predictions. I have to incorporate that materialization logic into my serving system. And I have to do this every time I want to add a new predictive component to my, to my production environment. Making these uh, built from scratch solutions even more brittle is the fact that they're spanning a bunch of different systems. It's spatially inefficient. And I'm also serving stale predictions. Because even though I'm getting new training data constantly from my cats reacting to our predictions, I can't incorporate that into the model until I've retrained it in Spark. And Spark is awesome, it's super efficient, but ultimately it's a batch system that trades latency for throughput. And then the last problem is this sample bias problem that we call the Taylor Swift effect. And this is basically the issue that I can only get training data, new training data, if I, about things that I'm showing my cats. So if I'm only ever playing Taylor Swift songs for my cats, because my cats have rated Taylor Swift highly, so that's the, the best predicted song to play, then I'm only going to learn their preferences for Taylor Swift really well. I'm not going to learn anything about how much they like all the other songs. I might end up stuck in a local maximum. So there's a whole bunch of issues with doing this today. And this is where Velox comes in. Velox is a system to manage this entire machine learning lifecycle. Um, and just sort of abstract away and take care of all these problems. And ultimately, Velox is a new type of system that's designed to fit in with your web serving system and your batch training system and take care of the, um, the predictive analytics component of your production environment. So Velox basically is a system to take care of the data, the model, and the, serving, and the prediction serving all in one. So let's take a look at what Vel how Velox actually works today. Well, right now, there's basically two components to Velox. There's a prediction service and a model manager. The prediction service takes care of all things predictions. It figures out how to provide scalable and low latency predictions, and how to figure out which predictions to get uh, to provide so that we avoid this sample bias effect. And the model manager takes care of constantly retraining the model 
as we get more and more training data through a long, a long living system. So what are the benefits of doing this in a single system? Why do we need this new type of system? Well, as I just said, we can provide low latency and scalable predictions as a service. You no longer need to build this system from scratch every time. This integrated approach actually leads to better, fresher predictions. It makes it easy to translate um, a model that you've developed in Spark in a batch system that maybe your data scientist has developed and get that into production without your data scientist having to write production code and without your front end engineers needing to worry about machine learning. And sort of going along with all of this, it eases a lot of the operational pain of deploying these different systems, integrating them together, and just the engineering hours of debugging and getting all this to work right. Now, this is a, a pretty broad, ambitious set of benefits, and um, there's probably a lot of ways that we could take this. And Velox, as a research project, is really interested in exploring and pushing the boundary in all of these areas. But as a first step, Velox is really focused on providing personalized modeling, to provide personalized predictions, um, and for a model that fits a very specific but broad class of machine learning models. So personalized modeling is really great. We can provide a tailored user experience to all of our users. But there's some problems with doing this in a naive way. There's a, the statistical problem of if I'm training a personalized model on all of my users independently, I may not have enough training data um, to really get robust models to, uh, on all of my users, all of my cats. And there's also the computational issue that training all of these models independently actually takes a lot of compute time um, and is expensive from a resource perspective. So Velox addresses this by taking a, a two-tiered approach. We train a big set of models on all of the training data, getting a much more robust model. And this is shared among all of our users. And then we add a small, cheap layer of personalization on top that's cheap to maintain and cheap to compute, but still allows us to tailor this model to each of our users individually. So what does that look like in Velox? Well, there's two components. There's the set of shared basis features. This is that big model. And these are, um, these are models in and of themselves. They're, they might be big models. They're trained in Spark. Um, and they predict things about, uh, about the things that we're trying to recommend. And then to add a layer of personalization on top, we add a per user weighting, a per user weight vector that weights the importance of these features differently for every user in the system. And there's a few advantages to separating uh, the model into these two components. I'm going to go through a bunch of them. But one of the first ones is that these, model, these two types of models actually have pretty different characteristics. The set of shared feature functions is trained on all of the training data and doesn't change that fast. The characteristics of a song are not actually changing that quickly. But these per user models might change really quickly as our users' preferences are changing, their moods are different at different times of the day. And so by separating out this per user weighting, we can be highly dynamic and adapt to very quickly changing user preferences. So let's take a look at how Velox handles model prediction serving. So I keep mentioning that we provide predictions as a service. We provide a simple REST-like API to provide these predictions. So our prediction API is pretty simple right now. There's two components. You can ask for a prediction for a given user and a given item, turn the, the predicted score, the predicted rating for that song, that item. And then there's also this predict top K call, which asks for the top K items of basically all my items that I could possibly serve. And this is going to have some advantages because it's going to give Velox um, some flexibility in how it serves predictions and help address this feedback issue, this Taylor Swift effect. And I'll get to that in a minute. OK, so how do we actually serve predictions? How do we do this efficiently? Well, computing these predictions has two components. We have to look up this per user weight vector, this per user state, and we have to compute the features. Looking up the per user weight vector um, is pretty simple because we make the observation that every prediction is tied to a specific user. So we partition our users across the cluster. We route every prediction request to the appropriate partition. And then we can do a simple lookup in local storage without having to go over the network. And we can do this really quickly, even, the, even though this is changing state. 
And then to compute the features, although computing the features for a specific item might be kind of expensive, we have to evaluate a whole bunch of different models um, for a given item just to make a single prediction. These features are shared among all of our users, so we can reuse this work. So we have this feature cache that shares this feature computation among all the users in a given partition. And that way, for a specific item, we only ever need to compute the features for it once because these features are shared between all of our users. OK, so how does Velox handle? That's how Velox handles uh, prediction serving. Let's talk about this feedback issue for a second. Well, in Catify, there really was no concept of of the feedback having any control or any interaction with the model. Even though uh, we are serving predictions, we're getting feedback and we're using that to retrain the model, the, the serving system, has no, which is what's generating this new training data, has no connection with the, the training system that's retraining the model. There's no collaboration here. But it turns out that if we, do, if we, if we make uh, a, the system aware of this connection and take an integrated approach we can do a lot better than this and avoid this sample bias effect. So one simple way to do this is using an algorithm called epsilon greedy. And here the idea is that while we usually serve the item with the highest predicted score, so we usually play Taylor Swift, sometimes we're gonna pick a random other item to play for our user. So sometimes we'll play them Slayer. And this works okay. Um, we do get a better exploration of the feedback space. We do get more, um, more training data and more variety of training data. But the problem is that a user who's listening to Taylor Swift probably doesn't like Slayer. And so our user experience can really suffer. So can we do better? It turns out there's a whole area of machine learning research called active learning that looks explicitly at this feedback problem. How can we make good predictions and provide a good user experience while still exploring the feedback space better? And in Velox, we use a really simple uh, active learning algorithm called LinUCB. And LinUCB basically makes the observation that these, along with these predictions, there's an uncertainty associated with every prediction. And so if we look at the upper confidence bound, this combined metric of the predicted score and its uncertainty, we can serve items that are predicted to probably have a pretty good score while at the same time directly reducing this uncertainty. So while we would usually play Taylor Swift, when, we're, when we have LinUCB, we're gonna play the Beatles and to reduce the uncertainty in our prediction about the Beatles. Because it turns out that maybe our user really likes the Beatles even more so than Taylor Swift. So that's one of the advantages of having this integrated approach, is we, is we can take a principled, um, a principled approach to gathering this feedback and retraining the model. But that's all, everything I've talked about so far is basically the prediction service. How we compute predictions and how we pick which predictions to serve. But there's a whole other component. If, I am, if I'm running this system in production, I'm running it for you know, months and years, then I want to be able to manage my models, retrain them as I'm getting this new training data, and, and manage this process. And Velox can do this. Um, one of the ways that Velox does this is through some real-time learning. So while in Catify, there was no real-time learning, every time we want to retrain the model, we have to run a batch system like Spark. We can, we can get away with not doing this all the time in Velox. So along with this prediction API, there's actually a third uh, REST call. There's this observation call. And here, we allow the front end system to provide new training data directly to Velox. So every time we get a new observation, every time we get a new training point, we update the model. Specifically, we update this per user weight vector adapting really quickly to changing user preferences, while not incurring the cost of retraining these shared basis feature functions. We leave them fixed. So that's real-time learning. Now eventually, we're gonna wanna do some offline training, retraining these feature functions. Um, and to do this, Velox uses Spark. We use all the awesome existing work in batch training big machine learning models on lots of data. So that's the model manager. So, so taking another step back, let's look, at, let's look at this machine learning lifecycle again. We use Spark, which is this awesome system you guys are probably all aware of, to train the machine learning models. Um, 
to train these big shared basis feature functions. And Velox is really a project to manage the rest of the machine learning lifecycle and take an integrated approach to this type of management. And we actually think that this type of integrated approach is gonna be really important going forward. In the future, scalable machine learning research isn't gonna be, be able to get away with treating the end of a model's life cycle as sitting trained in HDFS with some graph that computes testing error. We think that the future of machine learning research is really gonna to have to consider all of these components together. And that's where we're gonna see the real breakthroughs. So to wrap up, right now, the state of model training is kind of broken. We have a bunch of ad hoc processes. They span a bunch of like, multiple systems. We have to build them from scratch. And we're losing out on a lot of the benefits of cutting edge machine learning research. And that's where Velox comes in. Velox is a new type of system to manage the machine learning lifecycle, to provide low latency and scalable and right now personalized predictions as a service and maintain these models and manage the retraining process. Additionally, Velox is part of the badass stack. It's coming soon. We're hoping to uh, do an alpha release sometime in the first quarter of next year. Um, and taking this integrated approach, integrating Velox with the rest of the stack brings all the benefits of the existing research. If you want to know more, we just launched a project page on the AmpLab website. We have a paper coming up in CIDR this winter. Um, which you can find linked to on this web page. And I'd love to talk to you about this. I'm going to be around for the rest of the day. I'd love to hear your feedback. These are pain points you're having. If you think we're missing anything, um, please come to find me. Uh, and with that, I think I have time for maybe one question. Uh, thank you. Sure, good. So basically, we, we focused on this specific type of uh, personalized model right now as a first step. Um, there's actually a couple machine learning students in the lab who are really exploring how can we make this model formulation that Velox supports much more general. We're also interested in how can we train parts of this share, these shared models online. So no, this is absolutely uh, research that we're interested in. But um, we basically picked this model formulation as a first step. Okay. Yeah, so we're going to have a break yeah. in a little bit. And, and I'll be around. Please come find me. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, I, I want the... Uh...